Okay, thank you to everybody um, who's with us today. On behalf of Vivi, I'm so happy to welcome you today. I'm Rachel Duda, the Vice President of Learning at Vivi, and I'm so excited to talk to Dr. Rebecca Schrage Hirschberg today about something that I know is uh, on everybody's minds right now, which are transitions. Um, whether you're starting back to daycare this fall, moving to a new classroom, welcoming a new sibling or something else altogether, we know that transitions can be really challenging for everyone in the family. We're so lucky today to be joined by Dr. Rebecca Schrage Hirschberg, a clinical psychologist and parenting coach and author of the Tantrum Survival Guide to talk more about this topic today. Rebecca has joined our community in the past um, for other webinars and her advice is always invaluable. Together, we're gonna do our best to address some of your pressing questions and help you and your child with whatever transitions are coming your way. If you're not already familiar with Vivi, just gonna give you a quick overview of what we do. Um, Vivi is on a mission to reinvent childcare and early learning for today's families. We currently have six campuses in New York and one new campus opening soon in Westchester. And we specialize in learning and care for ages six weeks to five years old. And we also partner with employers of all sizes to bring child care and early learning to their working families as a benefit. And we truly believe it's our mission to support the whole family, not with just high quality learning and care, but also with education and resources for those early years, which is why we're hosting this conversation today. Before we get started, just a few program logistics that I wanted to share with you. Um, I wanna say I just appreciate that so many of you are here with us today. Um, Rebecca and I were talking right before we signed on that you know, on a Wednesday, August 9th, so many of you are joining us today, so we appreciate that. Um, we also have about 45 minutes together and we'll use 30 of those minutes to run through some questions um, that I've put together for Rebecca. And then we'll go through some of your questions. So the chat function is open. So feel free to drop in a question anytime along the webinar and we'll do our best to get to as many as we can in the time that we have together. And of course, there's no way that we'll get to everything in our short 45 minutes together, but we'll certainly do our best and you'll walk away from this webinar with at least one practical tool or tip to help you feel better prepared for the transitions you may be dealing with in your own family. So with all of that, let's dig in. Rebecca, we called this webinar Preparing Your Child for Transitions, but as we spoke about during a recent conversation, preparing for transitions is often just as much about preparing yourself as it is preparing your child. Can you talk a little bit more about why that's so relevant uh, and how regulating our own feelings and emotions as a parent can impact your child's responses to a transition? Sure. Um, so I would just alter one thing you said and say it's actually more important. <laughs> to yeah. uh, and that's because these things and, and this comes up in so many talks that I give, they trickle down, right? The emotions and the energy that parents embody trickles down to our kids. And so if we're really nervous or anxious or high strung about transitions, then even if we're saying the right words and kind of doing the right things with our kids, that's gonna get overshadowed by what they can pick up we're actually feeling, which is anxious. And of mm -hmm. course, all of us are feeling anxious right now because transitions are hard. Um, and I think if you're noticing, you know, if you're participating in this webinar and you're noticing your own blood pressure, you know, start to rise, like, oh gosh, it's really happening. Like August is really continuing to, <laughs> to go by. <laughs> um, that's real. And so the best thing we can do is think about how do we prepare ourselves for these family transitions that are coming up? And then inevitably what follows from that is preparing our kids and not the other way around. Absolutely. That's so important. And something that I have to remind myself all the time as a parent is I've got to control my own feelings and emotions because that definitely trickles down to my, my foursome. Um, and I, I also want to acknowledge that this month in particular is challenging for so many parents. Um, mo most of us want to spend August like really leaning into summer uh, and, and taking what we can from it. But the truth is, uh, this is when so many of us start to feel like those Sunday scaries uh, on a larger scale. 
And this month turns into one giant worry fest. Um, can you talk about preparing versus worrying and what does that look like um, and how can parents implement this approach? Yeah, I was just, as you were talking, I was trying to think of a good acronym, right? We've got Sunday scaries, <laughs> August anticipation, August, I don't know, but mm -hmm. um, it is very real. And I think the distinction that you just drew in your question is the essential one, which is what's the difference between worrying and preparing? Because what I see in a lot of my clients and myself, <laughs> I have two kids also, um, is this idea that I want to be really present with my kids and make the most of summer and make memories and all the rest. And so I'm kind of really doing my best to do that, but I'm also distracted and nervous. And I'm kind of ruminating in my head about the things I have to do. And I'm going over the list in my head and I'm worrying and I'm feeling anxious and I'm perseverating. So I'm not actually present with my kids, right. but I'm also not doing anything productive to prepare. And so my recommendation would be, can we delineate those two things? Can we try, of course, to be present with our kids and make memories? I'm saying make memories because it's all over Instagram right now. It's, it um, is, yes. You know, Four <laughs> memories, yeah. <laughs> um, but be present with our kids, enjoy our kids, their home, enjoy summer. And then at times that they're either either their nap time or when they're in bed or just taking a break and maybe you have a child care provider who's helping or whatever, sitting down and actually preparing you know, making the actual list, crossing things off the list, doing the things that need to happen so that you can feel more prepared for and regulated going into the fall. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of parents get in trouble with that kind of, I'm half in here and I'm half in there, um, as opposed to saying, I'm going to be fully here and fully there. And it may mean that I'm not doing either one for as much time, but the time that I'm devoting to it is quality and I'm there in it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You know, Rebecca, I'd love to hear um, from some of those joining us today um, to hear what type of transition might be looming for them. Um, so for those of you joining us today, if you wouldn't mind just typing into the, into the chat um, something that you're anticipating as a transition that we could help support you with today. Um, see a couple of coming through potty training. That's a big transition. Absolutely. would love to hear from others too, so we can address some of those as we go through this. Great. Um, okay. So we know that, you know, we can't necessarily uh, do anything about what's out of our control, but we can take actions to address things that are in our control. What can we start working on now to help prepare for some of these fall transitions that some of us might be thinking about? So I'm seeing just, I haven't actually opened the chat, but the ones I've seen pop up are potty training, new uh, care provider, going from a crib to a bed. Mm -hmm. and I, think, I think one of the things that's most important to do with any of those and any transition, and some of sometimes it's dictated for you and sometimes you can decide, is looking at a calendar, frankly, and saying, okay, when am I actually going to do this, right? So when when are we going to start potty training or when are we moving to the bed or when is the provider starting and then kind of working backwards. And I think it's essential to look at what else do you have going on? Um, many families make the very well-intentioned and sometimes not helpable, you know, mistake of, of taking these on all at the same time or not really looking. And then it turns out you started potty training the day before you have a big work presentation or while your partner's out of town or, you know, and so really sitting down and looking at a calendar and looking at what else is going on. Do you have more than one kid? You don't want to start potty training, let's say your toddler on the first day of kindergarten for your older one. Really, really being strategic about how, what are my emotional resources? What is my physical plan? Am I at home? Am I not at home? Whatever. And then where am I going to be needed most and what makes the most sense? And if you're in a two-parent family, doing that with your partner is something that I would recommend. Mm -hmm. I can't tell you how many people make the mistake of, you know, yelling to their partner, not yelling, but like, you know, over their shoulder, like, by the way, we're getting the bed on whatever day. And so you guilty, know. guilty. <laughs> and then sure enough, the bed comes and you're ready to do it. And your partner's like, I can't believe, like I have saying late at work, I have this <laughs> dinner I can't miss. And you're like, What's your you know, and so really sitting with the calendars and planning for, um, for planning for these things, because what happens just to tie it back to the theme we were talking about in the beginning is that then you feel more relaxed and more in control and more regulated, which is going to set you up for success. Mm -hmm. if, you, if you are feeling like, 
oh God, the bed just got here and I think we were going to do this or, you know, I sh oh, shoot, I should put the different potties in the different rooms, right? You know, if you're feeling kind of frenzied about it, that frenzied energy is going to trickle down to your kid and not set your family up for success for whatever the transition is. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. I'm guilty of that. I have to say, and it's, it's never worked out well. So I really encourage everybody to, to sit down and get on the same page with their partners because it does make a world of difference. Um, I always recommend, sorry if I'm interrupting. No, please. This is like, the, if I could commit, so if you have kids who are too little, then it would just be a partner check-in. But if you have kids who are old enough to participate, having a family check-in or a family meeting every Sunday, um, I often recommend to clients just because it's fun, um, Sunday Sundays right? Or Sunday, Sunday bar. And then everybody likes it. It's a fun thing. It's not like a family meeting. Everybody kind of, oh, you know, it's like, you've got a Sunday bar, you're having ice cream and you're talking about what's going well in our family, what could go better in our family. And then what's coming down the pike? Like, what does the week look like? Who's out when? What are the moving pieces? And if you can get in the habit of doing that every week, if that's one practical tip you can kind of take from today. I feel like that can be life-changing. It's so funny that you said that. Um, I actually had a family meeting with my husband and my, our four kids last night um, over dinner. And I said, we have something really serious that we need to talk about because one of the one of the things in our family that has gotten a little bit out of control is bedtime. Um, I have four children from five years old to nine years old. And, you know, laying with each of them has just become like this long drawn out process and something that um, we needed to change. So we had a, we had a family meeting last night about that and what that was going to look like uh, for the upcoming night. And I asked for my, my children's thoughts and feelings and ideas so that we can craft a plan that works for everybody. Um, and I agree, it was really powerful. And, you know, it's something that you can even do with children younger than that, too. Um, you know, really include children in the plan. They feel empowered when they think like, oh, wow, we're in this together. Um, and I have to say, we had a successful night. So the the beauty and the power of a family meeting really helps um, prepare everybody for any transition that might be coming your way. So I agree with you for sure on that. It takes notes, you know, especially like a five or six year old who's excited to do that. Yep. You know, and then everybody signs. Yep. My favorite example is I worked with a family where they had a family meeting and they thought that the um, three-year-old daughter wouldn't be able to really participate, but they had her there hanging out. And then they were talking about what could be better in this family. And she was saying, and she ended up saying, I think we could have more things that are pink. And so Oh, they got some like pink doilies and like wall decorations to hang, you know, like again, for that power of like, you are being heard. Mm -hmm. Something again, to bring it back to the theme we're talking about today, it sounds so silly, but let's say this little girl says we need more things that are pink. And so you get some pink doilies and hang them on the wall. The transition is going to go easier, right? If she's moving to a bed or if she's going to a new daycare or going to a new preschool or a new classroom. Why? Because she feels heard. She feels in control of something. And so much of this period of time is about kids and grownups feeling out of control, feeling like they're in those cartoons where like just balls are, you know, flying at their heads. And so it's all connected. Um, Absolutely. That can go smoother when you take these steps. Absolutely. So let's, let's talk a little bit more about our children. Um, for the youngest ones, they might not always realize or notice that there's a transitioning happening or about to happen, but for toddlers and beyond, um, what can we do? What are some more things that we can do to help prepare our children? Um, can you walk us through some, uh, through a plan for preparing for a new school or caregiving experience or whatever might be coming their way? Sure. I just want to say that the littlest ones will notice exactly what we've talked about. I don't want to kind of put too hard a point on it, but they won't notice that you're starting a new job, but they'll notice that you seem anxious, right? And so parents will say in September, let's say that their six-month-old is suddenly more cranky. And it's like, right, well, I bet you just ended vacation and you're going back to work and the rhythms have changed. And, and so the little ones do pick up on that. For toddlers, I think what you're getting at, which makes perfect sense, is how can you explicitly prepare them? How can you actually maybe start bringing this into kind of consciousness and, and dialogue? Um, so I wouldn't do it too soon. You, you certainly can. And I, and I, I never recommend um, not mentioning a transition that's happening until until the day before, right? So let's say your child is starting a new school. That shouldn't be information that you hide 
and then suddenly talk about. You can bring it up kind of once in a while so they know it's coming, so that there's no family secret, so that they don't overhear you talking about it with your partner, let's say, but you're not actually sitting down and talking to them about it in a kind of conscious and like, let's sit and talk about this until probably roughly five to seven days before mm -hmm. uh, is about what five, four or five-year-olds can handle. Three-year-olds probably a little less. Then you want to think about who is your kid. There are kids who do really well if you sit down and say, just like you said to your kids last night, let's sit and talk about something. There are other kids where that's like a surefire recipe for like Zoom they're out. <laughs> You know, and those are the kids you need to talk to in the car, right? I often think talking in the car is a great idea. There are kids who feel like when you're looking at them, it's too much pressure. You can talk to them when you're unloading the dishwasher, when you're both sitting and drawing with crayons. Sometimes families make this mistake of trying to sit and really have a conversation with their four-year-old, and that's not how four-year-olds necessarily relate. So be flexible about kind of the setting and who your four-year-old is in terms of activity level. And then you really just want to say, hey, so, you know, in five days, you know, one, two, three, four, five, things are going to be a little different around here, you know, and you just start with what, you know, we're going to, we're going to wake up earlier, you know, so it's going to be a little darker. And instead of sitting in our pajamas, we're going to get dressed and we're going to leave and we're, you know, and you're telling us sort of childhood story, a social story, as we call it, of what is school going to look like. Um, you don't have to worry about the school part, right? School will take care of that. But you're talking about we're going to we're going to get up, we're going to get dressed, we're going to get in the car or we're going to walk down to the subway or we're going to walk three blocks and we're going to. Be, you know, whatever sort of that morning is, and then who's going to pick up your kid. And you're just, you're not overwhelming them with information, but you're just giving them a sense of what the flow is going to be. Um, and then you're really open to whatever they say next. And when I say whatever they say next, they may say, can I have a snack? Sure. Right. Yeah. Let's have some goldfish. Right. Yeah. I've seen parents completely be like, what do you think about that? What do you think? What do you think? Did you hear me? Did you hear me? What Again, that's bringing your own agenda and your own anxiety to the conversation. Your kid may be fine. Your kid may be like, all right, cool. Or they may need a couple hours to just digest. And then they ask you at bedtime, wait, so what's the thing you said about the subway? You know, um, you're really going at it with kind of a light. Did I just freeze? I think so. I, we can hear you. Oh, there oh, you go. You're yeah. back. <laughs> I was going like this. I was very, um, but you're going at it with kind of a light energy, right? You're approaching the conversation with curiosity mm -hmm. um, and ideally so are they. And that's really all you need to do. And then you kind of repeat it here and there, you know, you never expect that it's a one and done, you know, oh, it's coming up, you know, it's coming up. And then, and then one thing I think it can be really important is, um, modeling different feelings about the transitions, right? Because parents will say to their kids, how do you feel? Are you scared? Are you nervous? That you're not going to get a lot from your kid in that way. They learn very quickly kind of what are the right answers to those questions, if they answer at all. A lot of times they just shut down. And I think you're much better off saying, you know, I'm feeling a little sad that the summer's ending because we've had so much great family time together. And I'm also really excited for the fun things we're going to do in the fall and that you're starting school and you have a brand new teacher. I'm, I'm feeling two things at the same time. There's a great Daniel Tiger song about that that I love, um, but kind of modeling how we feel going into transitions and even saying, I'm a little nervous. Mm -hmm, absolutely. And then the only other thing I'd add, which I should have said before, is when you're having this conversation, also make sure to mention things that are going to be the same. Right. So it's yeah. going to be a little different, but we're still, you're still going to wake up wearing, you know, your favorite, you know, Encanto pajamas. And you're still going to have, you know, Honey Nut Cheerios for breakfast, you know, whatever. Like you're naming that the family rituals and routines, which kids get so attached to and they help them feel safe, are still going to be the same in a lot of ways. It's not suddenly their whole world is going to be turned upside down. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned, you mentioned the idea of social stories, which I think are, can be so powerful for children. And you know, for, for families, even sitting down together with their child and going through the steps. And as you're doing that, writing the story out, and that becomes, 
your bedtime story for the next week until the transition happens. And children find a lot of comfort in stories and in books. And so actually creating that story together um, that they can keep going back to is a really powerful thing. And that can take place, you know, whether or not, whether you're transitioning from a crib to a bed or whether or not you're getting ready for kindergarten. And like you said, Rebecca, not only talking about the things that will be different, but also adding the things to the story that will be the same. Um, and that will be uh, really powerful for children too. Um, a lot of websites, now I'm not remembering off the top of my head, but there's a lot of, if you just type in kind of social stories, there's a, I remember when Henry just to go, when well, Henry's my nine-year-old, who's potty trained, thank you. <laughs> but when we were potty training with him, we, we did a photo book that there was a script online and you could put in his photo and a picture of his potty and a picture of his new underwear and a picture, you know, and it became a social story that was really helpful for him that we had some help putting together. Mm -hmm. You can also do it on a legal pad with like chicken scratch and stick yep. figures. Like you don't have to get all Pinteresty. Yeah. <laughs> but if you want to, those resources are out there. Yeah, they're really great. Um, so we we're we're talking a lot about preparing for transitions, but what about coping during transitions? What are some feelings or behaviors? that we might see from our children? Um, and, you know, how do we know if it's normal uh, and and what might, might require some additional support or help? It's a great question. So the, the first thing that I recommend everyone kind of write down or print out and hang on the fridge is transitions take time. <clears throat> This is not a one week situation, right? A lot of times, and I make this mistake, right? I used to just take, make the first week of September kind of much lighter for my schedule. And then by the second week, I would schedule patients as usual. No, right? If you are able to be flexible in whatever it is that you have going on in your life, these transitions take two, three weeks. It may be not till October, you know, that you're feeling you know, more, and, and I'm talking about a traditional kind of school model, but it could be, let's say the potty training or the new caregiver, like several weeks before everybody kind of finds a rhythm. So to have patience with yourself and patience with your kids. The second thing that I think can be really useful to keep in mind is, is a very basic idea of, of brain development, which is that, and not to get, you know, everybody falling asleep, but it's really interesting because our brain, our neuron, our neuron pathways, the pathways between neurons in our brains at these ages, they're finite, right? And what I mean by that is that if your child um, is kind of using their brain space, quote unquote, to have mastered separation, to have mastered losing their pacifier, to have mastered potty training, sleeping by themselves. And then let's say you throw in a new baby, right? Or another transition. They have to allocate, and again, this is very oversimplified if we have any neuroscientists watching, but they have to allocate kind of brain resources to sort of figuring out this new baby and kind of keeping it together. And so it's very possible that they'll have a regression in one of those other ways. That's why regressions are so common during transitions, right? There's a new baby and your older one starts peeing in their pants again right? Or they switch to a new classroom and they have a harder time falling asleep at night. That's because they they are taking kind of their, their efforts and their energy and their literal brain power to navigate this. And so it has to come from somewhere. And I think that's really useful when we think about what are the behaviors we start to see from kids during transitions. We see difficulty sleeping, we might see pickier eating, a need to be kind of more in control, more difficulties with emotion regulation. Emotion regulation is a skill, right? They may have learned to tolerate a certain level of frustration or disappointment. And when they're going through a transition, suddenly they can tolerate less. Don't panic. It's all really normal. And it all usually lasts a few weeks, mm -hmm. a month. In terms of when to worry, you're looking at duration right? If suddenly it's two months after your new caregiver got there and we're still not really in a rhythm and you're looking at what we call clinically kind of distress and impairment, right? So how distressed is your kid? How distressing is it for the whole family that your kid is going through this? And is it getting in the way? Like in a real way, you know, is it really interfering with their ability to do whatever it is they need to do? Um, and if so, then you seek some support, right? It's not like if so, Oh God, you know, it's just like, if so, okay, maybe you get a little bit of help from someone like me from, some, you know, whether it's a therapist, a coach or a daycare teacher or a preschool teacher who can help give some tips. It just means you might need a little extra 
effort. It doesn't mean that this is a horrible transition and everything is doomed. Yeah. And I, you know, I think um, like I like to share with parents, like never worry alone, right? Like if you have a village of people, especially if you are in a school or daycare setting to lean on. So if your child is, you know, having some separation or transition um, issues at school, lean, lean on the support system that you have there, never worry alone. And, um, you know, I think that's helpful to think about. Um, and I, I, I'll never forget my youngest or sorry, my oldest now was going through a sleep regression, you know, the, like the three month sleep regression, and he had just been sleeping really well. And I was patting myself on the back and then the three month, four month sleep regression hit. And he was up just at the same time as I was going back to work and everything. And a wise friend of mine said, this too shall pass. And I've kept that with me along every single transition that I've experienced with my children, that this too shall pass, right? And it's just that comforting piece to say, like, this is a moment in time, it will not last forever. Uh, and it just like helps to kind of settle me that yes, this is hard right now, but it will not always be this hard. And I think that's really important to keep kind of at the front of the front of mind. I have so many parents who have come to me and said, potty training, it's not working. We've been doing it for a week. And I'm, I think I'm just going to stop completely because it's not working. Um, and just like you said, Rebecca, to give it some time um, and, and not to de- get discouraged or uh, kind of move away from something just because it's not immediately uh, working right away. And also, Rachel, I'm so glad you used the words right now, because along with this too shall pass, which is certainly in my toolbox, um, adding the words right now. Mm-hmm. So parents will come to me and I'll say, my child is such a picky eater. And I'll say, your child's such a picky eater right now. Yes. Right. Or, oh, my child cannot sleep through the night. My child can't sleep through the night right now. Right. Potty training is not working right now. You know, and just those two words can change your whole. Sometimes I do practice with clients, like notice what it feels like when you say it without the right now in your body and then with the right now. And there is this, oh, we can exhale. It's just right now. Okay. Right. You know, right. and, um, And so, yeah, really, really helpful information. Absolutely. Um, And just a reminder to everybody, please um, feel free to send some questions through, drop them in the chat. We'd love to hear from you. Um, But I wanted to talk a little bit about collaboration. We did did just kind of touch on that a little bit with our partners and our caregivers or teachers, but um, we did get quite a few questions that came through um, earlier about how to work together with a partner or someone in your life. Um, to create consistency, um, to get on the same page, et cetera. So can you share any strategies around how you can lean on your partner or your village um, during a transition and how to do so in a way that doesn't cause more stress for everybody? Yeah. So I think we hit on a big one, which Mm -hmm. is, which is taking time to kind of plan ahead the logistics and the calendar. Um, it can feel like a burden now, but I promise it's a bigger burden later. If you don't do it, it's one of those kind of, you know, pre or post, which are you going to choose pick your poison, but the, usually when you do it sooner, and especially if you do it sooner over like wine and cheese or some, you know, like, it, like it doesn't have to be this giant task that everybody's dreading. Um, I would also say really being, you know, an old kind of And I'm thinking particularly about partners, but it can also be with kind of best friends or um, if people have nannies, Um, but this old sort of couples therapy idea of using I statements, right? When, when X happens, I feel Y. And then I wonder if you could help me with that, right? So something like, you know, when school is starting for the kids or when we're about to go through a transition with the little ones, I start to feel really nervous. It would be really helpful for me if you could blah, 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 you know, really just being vulnerable and asking for help um, as opposed to expecting mind reading. Um, People like to feel useful. I mean, I've had parents say, and they always think it's like totally cheesy and then they love it, but I've had them say to their partners, like, when we hit September, I feel really on edge. It would really help me if when you come home from work, you bring me flowers and say, thank you. And they'll all say, oh, well, that doesn't count because I have to tell them. And it's like, I promise it counts. And then sure enough, when it happens, it feels great. 
And like, yeah, you told them to do it, but that's because, you know, someone just wrote, I love that. I mean, <laughs> it's it's saying, I, you know, when this happens, I feel is here's what you can do. And then often your partners are like, oh, there's something I can do. Because so often, especially if there's a partner who's less involved in, in childcare, which is often the case, that person feels sort of helpless. And they'll say, what can I do? What can I do? And you're just like, oh my God, are you kidding me? Here's a list of, you know, you can say, here's what you can do, you know? All of our kids' birthdays are coming up in the fall. I'm dealing with getting all the school supplies and whatnot. Can you please call the pediatrician and make their visits, you know, schedule their health, their well child, you know, whatever it is, really being explicit um, about what you need and what would be helpful in advance of, as you said, all the tension kind of rising, I think can be really, really useful during this time. Yeah, I love that. Um, we, we also, um, we also had quite a few questions come in about um, resilience and parents asking about resilience and what can a child withstand and when is change too much? So essentially like how resilient are our children? Uh, if we had, you know, a, a change from uh, a school change and then they're going to another school the year after and we're also welcoming a baby in six weeks, like my child's resilient, but is this asking too much? Can you talk a little bit about resilience with young children? When I talk about, I give <laughs> I'm just on resilience. Um, I have a lot to say about resilience, but what I will say in this particular context, I, I think it's an often um, overused, frankly, and misunderstood concept. And the way that I'm hearing it being misunderstood, I think here is being resilient doesn't mean not having feelings. So I would imagine that this parent who's saying, is this too much for my kid? It's another way of asking, is this going to be really hard for my kid? And the answer is, and my guess would be yes. You know, I don't know your kid and there are some kids that can kind of let things roll off. But mostly if you throw those three things, I don't, I know there was a new baby in there and moving and I forget what else, like it's probably going to be a really rough stretch for your kid. That doesn't mean they're not resilient. It doesn't mean they're not going to bounce back. Like what would it look like if you're, if you're not resilient, it means you're not going to make it right? Or that you're not going to, or you're not going to make it without like lasting lifelong damage. So yes, <laughs> your kid is resilient and your kid can handle it, especially if it's things that are not in their control. A three-year-old doesn't get to decide when a family has to move or when a new sibling is coming along. However, I think this parent is really wise to say, wait a second, I think we've got a lot coming down the pike for my kid to handle. And so what can I do to help this child as much as I can and to be supportive and be there, excuse me, be there for them as they exper experience, excuse me, these difficult feelings. And I think that's how we build resilience. We build resilience by not getting thrown by our kids' emotional reactions, right? If your kid is having a hard time with all the transitions and you're panicking because, oh God, they're not resilient. They're crying every day. They're having meltdowns all the time. Oh God, we shouldn't have done this. What a mess, to, you know? that's sending them the message that they're not resilient. Mm -hmm. If they're having that same level of meltdown every day and you're there like, I know there's so much happening. There's so much, it feels like so much, come here, let's snuggle. Or I know you're gonna get through this meltdown. I'm right here. I'm gonna return some emails, but I'm, you know, and you're not thrown by it. That's how we build resilience. That's how our kids learn that they can experience feelings and still be okay. Mm -hmm. But the idea that resilience is equated with their not having feelings or not having a hard time, that's a myth. And I don't know where it started. And it's the wrong understanding of the term. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think also a point there is, is for parents to, you know, model some of this too and, and, you know, use language if they're going through something that is hard or challenging, you know, to say like, wow, that was really hard for me. And here's what I did to make, you know, this, this work out in a right way. Right. Like, I think children, like you said, not only kind of feel energy and feelings and emotions from a parent, but parents are the best models when it comes to, you know, being able to show a child what something can be like or should be like. And to be authentic in that. Mm -hmm. to be, as a, I, I remember my kids, and again, I do this for a living, but my kids, when they were in daycare, the hardest part of the day was when I would pick them up and I would bring them home. And then I would have to get dinner on the table. And for a while I was faking it, right? I was pretending like, oh, I wanted to hear about their day. And I was like sort of engaged with them and sort of not. And they were having these meltdowns every day. 
And then I realized I was so not being authentic because I was actually inside. All I wanted to do was get dinner on the table and I was panicking, but I was trying to pretend like I wasn't. And so I started to, when we would get home, say like, oh God, here's this awful time where you just got home and you want my attention, but I have to get dinner ready and I hate it. And, the, you know, and, and they would sort of like be calm because I was just naming how hard it was and showing them that we would get through it together. And that ended up being such a better way of handling it for our family than this idea of not naming what I was actually feeling and being less authentic. And there's a lot of research supporting that, that kids, you know, back to the original point, can sense your energy. And when you're faking it, it actually causes their stress to rise rather than to fall. Mm -hmm, absolutely. Um, can we talk a little bit about some very practical strategies that parents can implement before like the back to school, back to daycare transition? Um, what are some things that parents can do like very practically um, to get ready for back to school, back to daycare? I know that, you know, something that I do is I start to prepare, you know, my children for an earlier wake up time. And so that means we set, you know, we start the bedtime routine about 15 minutes earlier for over the course of a week to get ourselves there. What are some other things that parents can do to prepare for this back to school, back to daycare transition? Yeah, that's a great tip. The Because summer bedtime creep, I call it. Oh, you know, summer bedtime creep. Oh, we have this barbecue or we have that. Yeah. Great. But bringing it back in and exactly what you said, but I just want to explain it if people don't know that you, you can set your child's bedtime back by 15 minutes each evening. So that let's say their current bedtime is nine and you want to get it till eight, that'll take you four days because you'll do it 15 minutes at a time. And that's been shown to be the interval that kids don't necessarily notice in a good way that, you know, as opposed to if their bedtime's at nine and you try to go right for eight, it, they're going to, their systems aren't going to be able to adjust. Um, so certainly I think the sleep and the bedtime is key. Um, similarly, a lot of, there's also screen, screen creep. There's that meme on, on um, Netflix right now. That's like, you know, the beginning of summer is, you know, no screen times play outside. And by you know, middle of July, Netflix is your new parent. Yep. <laughs> and so, you know, again, and part of that's going to be easy to cut down on once they're actually in school, because they're not around a screen. However, I think starting to say, you know, in the fall, we're going to go back to whatever your screen time limits are. Um, I think something really simple, like figuring out in advance, what are the kids' school supplies? Um, you know, getting those early, ordering things. I mean, again, I think just the more you don't have to like go out and do is often the easiest. Um, does your school or daycare require you to bring um, meals? you know, bring lunch for your kids or snacks for your kids. And are you, you know, do you know what they like, what they're, you know, oftentimes if they ended in June and they're starting in September, their tastes have wildly changed. <laughs> and so, um, you know, making sure that you're up on their current tastes and, you know, perhaps planning for some things in advance. Um, I think I, 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 the only sort of note of caution I want to give is that when we talk about preparing and practical strategies, there's this insidious message of like, if I do enough, I'm going to nail it. You right. know, a lot of, I would imagine the people who are here listening are kind of high achieving type A, like, oh, I'm going to do this, this, and this, and then we're going to be good to go. I think the biggest way to prepare as counterintuitive as it is, is to accept that it's going to be difficult no matter what you do in advance. And that's okay. And to prepare yourself for some weeks that aren't going to feel as good, you know, mm -hmm. Maybe that means just resigning yourself and perhaps your partner too in a two-parent family for like, we're going to take out for a whole week. First week of school, we're just taking out food. I'm not, you know, we're not cooking. We're not, you know, and just naming that as opposed to each day feeling irritated that you didn't have a chance to figure out what was for dinner and then panicking and then frenzying. It's like, we're going to do pizza four nights in a row. Mm -hmm. you know, cheers. Absolutely. Yeah, I embrace <laughs> um, it. And just those sorts of things again, rather than waiting for that panic to set in when you realize you can't do everything and then the shame that follows to just say in advance, here's what I want to focus on. I want to focus on being there for my kids, let's say, when they come home from preschool or, or daycare and really being able to be with them. And that means I'm not going to be able to do these other things for a little while. And so here's how we're going to solve for that. Mm -hmm. um, that sort of thing. 
Yeah, I, I, I think, um, you know, one thing that I do with my kids is, and, it, and it, is, it, it builds connection and, and everything, but it also helps prepare for this transition is, you know, you talked about food, my kids can be really picky eaters, and I like to take them to the grocery store a week before school starts or daycare and have them be a part of picking out the snacks, the food, uh, so that there is like this investment in, in the process. And also, again, it empowers children to be able to make choices too. Um, so taking your child to the grocery store, or if you use Instacart, like having them sit with you while you, you know, make choices of food, um, can be a really great thing to help prepare for that transition. And even simple things like getting clothes out the night before I, my, my children choose all of their own clothes. Sometimes, you know, I kind of sit back and like, oh, you're really going to wear that. But I, I think that's really important for them. And so we do that the night before um, to get them ready to, you know, the next day so that it's not a battle in the morning and just things that you can do to make your lives a little bit easier. And that that preparation goes a long way. Sometimes parents in that first week of, of daycare or preschool um, or school want to leave notes in the lunch. Write them in advance. Yes. You know what they're going to say. Right. I mean, your kids don't, you know, they're going to say, I love you. I miss you. I hope you're having a great day, <laughs> you know, whatever it is. You can write, you know, eight notes in, you know, 15 minutes and mm -hmm. then just put them in a cabinet and they're done. Um, again, I've just pictured, again, it's all personal experience too, but like I'm running around looking for a marker and looking for, you know, like ripping a piece of paper, you know, just those little things can help you, as you said, feel more just sort of in control of the moments once the moments actually come, but they're not going, you can't solve for everything. I promise you, you're going to, you know, remember to write all the notes, but then forget that it's a nut-free daycare and unpack the peanut butter and jelly that you just meticulously made. And, you know, like something's going to happen and that's yes. okay. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, we had a question come through uh, that a parent is wondering about um, a, their child is transitioning uh, into the twos classroom, um, not at Vivi, but um, this the school asks parents to stay in the classroom with during the transition. Uh, and the parent is asking about your thoughts and feelings about that strategy. Do you think it's better for parents to, you know, be a part of the transition and to kind of gradually um, step away? Or is it better for just for parents just to leave uh, during the transition? I think there is no one size fits all. Yeah. And I know that's not a satisfying answer. I think there are kids for whom having the parent stay is really important and having kind of a gradual goodbye. I think there are kids for whom it's, you know, it's a Band-Aid situation. Do you like to rip it off? Do you like to peel it off? People feel very strongly about both, <laughs> depending on who they are and what feels good. The only thing that I do think is universal, which I think is important, um, this actually came up for me and my seven-year-old this morning, interestingly, but I never think it's okay to sneak away. Okay. Um, there are teachers at daycare. It's sort of an old school approach it's, and everybody has the best of intentions. And so again, I don't, I don't point fingers and say it's a horrible thing. I think it used to be the go-to was that, you know, oh, your child is, you know, your child is having fun. Just go, just go, just go. Then your child doesn't necessarily know to trust you when you say you will say goodbye, or suddenly they look around and you're not there, which is terrifying. It's also born out of a fear of your child's emotions, right? Maybe when maybe your child is really having fun, and when you say goodbye, they're going to get upset again, and that'll be a bummer. Sure, that'll be a bummer, and they'll be able to handle it. They'll get upset again, and they'll see that other grownups can care for them, and they'll see that you're still going to leave, which means you're not afraid of their being upset. But so that's the one thing I would caution when you're dealing with these sort of new separation strategies and different daycare and preschool providers are going to tell you what to do is it's really important to say goodbye, whether it's immediately or after 20 minutes, or even when your child is already engrossed in activities. Um, it is important, even if it's waving across the room, but just something so that it's not that they suddenly look up and they didn't know you were leaving and you're not there. Absolutely. Completely aligned there. Um, one, one last question that came through is kind of going back to uh, a child that might be struggling with a transition or having a hard time during a, a transition. Um, how can you teach a toddler who's around 16 months, like the ability to like regulate their emotions? Like what are some strategies and things that we can uh, teach our children? 
So there's a misconception because again, wouldn't it be great that we can always be didactic with our kids at whatever age we can sit down and sort of teach these things. And the fact is when kids are really little, it's so much more about their experiencing emotion regulation, which means they co-regulate with their caregiver. The best thing we can do to help a toddler learn to regulate their emotions is to not let our own emotions become dysregulated when they become dysregulated because they will, let's say they experience frustration. Experiencing frustration for the first time is, is awful, right? Wait, I can't get what I want when I want it. I mean, that's an awful feeling. We're used to it. So we don't panic when that happens. Your toddler might panic, but if they see that you're not panicking, oh, this, is, oh, I know what's happening. You really want that. And I'm saying, no, oh, that is hard, you know, but you're calm because you know, they're going to get through it. That's what will teach them over time to regulate their emotions. They will feel your calm and they will be able to take in that calm. The other thing is environment, right? Having structures, routines, predictability. It's a emotion regulation is this triad. It's a Venn diagram of co-regulation with caregivers, environment, and didactic. And the didactic is very, very, very small, if existent at all, when kids are at that age. It's much more about the co-regulation and the can I keep my child's environment consistent and predictable so that they can develop these skills without being in a state of fear or um, anxiety about what's coming next and when am I getting my next bottle and when am I, you know. Um, that sort of thing. Great. Thank you. Well, Rebecca, we're really close to time. Um, and I just want to thank you for joining us and remind everybody that you'll be emailing. Uh, we'll be emailing you with a recording from today. Um, we thank you so much for being here, everybody. And as always, please feel free to reach out with any questions you might have. Um, and thank you for taking time out of your very busy schedules to join us. Have a wonderful day, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Such a treat to be here. Thanks, Rebecca. Have a great one.